Here's one towards the goal. That's going to be blocked by Travis Ridgen. Well, this is more like it. This is Slang in the Biscuit. Here's Travis Ridgen and Dave Wheeler. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be episode 38, the uh, Olaf Kolzig, Jeff Delorier, Oilers legend. The, the Jeff Delorier. Yeah, Oilers legend episode. I am joined by somebody who is a uh, personal friend of many years. I played college, oh, sorry, I didn't play. I took stats with him uh, with, for the VIU Mariners college hockey program in beautiful Nanaimo, BC. I roomed with him in Flemingsburg, Sweden for a very short period of time before the shit hit the fan and we had to bounce jailbreak style. Welcome to the podcast program, Mr. Liam Sweeney. How are yeah, you, my yeah. friend? For all the new listeners uh, that haven't seen the Sweden vlogs, go check them out. They are hilarious. A little over the top at times, but... Yeah, um, it's actually really funny to watch me and Travis uh, completely get bent over by a hockey team, but some of my favorite memories of playing hockey were actually in uh, that Stockholm area, for sure. Like, that was a lot of fun, even though the place sucked. This is very true. I think one of the things that made it so exciting was the fact that, you know, September of 2020, August of 2020... Nobody's doing everything. Everybody's at home. Everybody's doing, you know, the things that you can't mention on the internet these days. And we're living our lives in a mall, in the mall of Scandinavia, 10,000 people shoulder to shoulder. We're playing hockey. We're living our lives to the fullest. Sweeney's going to the bar. You were going to the bar. You're having a good time. You brought me back cheesecake one time that you sat on at the bus stop. It's a true story. <laughs> true Sweeney's, story. Sweeney's goes on a date with uh, Lena. What's her name, right? I, I don't, honestly, I don't even remember. Okay. So he goes, uh, it, I think that tells a lot about the date. So he goes on a date with uh, no, Lena. I, I pulled. I pulled. Okay. I just left. Okay. <laughs> Uh, he, what he means is that he pulled a, a cheesecake, a piece of cheesecake for me from the um, uh, espresso house in Sweden, yep. brings it back home in a to-go box and says, hey, I was thinking of you. Here's a cheesecake. And I open it up and I said, what did you do? Sit on the thing? And he's like, I think I did. <laughs> I sat on my backpack at the bus stop and I get a Paper Mario thin piece of cheesecake. It was delicious. It's, much appreciated. Oh, man. All the pastries at that coffee shop, elite. Very so good. Very expensive. Very delicious. Yeah. The uh, Starbucks of Sweden. You could call the espresso house if you're not familiar. Yeah. But uh, our time in Sweden was very was very fun. Do you remember to I guess to I guess we'll get into that to start the podcast off. Why did you come to Sweden with me? I'm very curious because I know that I harassed you for months on end. But what made you come to Sweden and what got you to actually book a flight, put out the money, and then come see me? Um, realistically, I knew that um, I realistically knew that I did. I wasn't going to be playing hockey for too many more years, um, and I had a I, I have a British passport. Uh, which is grandfathered into the EU, and then I'm eligible for an Irish passport as soon as that expires. So for me to go over and play is really easy um, because I don't have to apply for a visa. I can just show up, which is nice. Uh, still an import um, in Sweden, um, but I could just show up. So it was more so I knew that college hockey wasn't going to happen in Canada that year. Me and Trav kind of got caught wind of that from every uh, every agent was telling us that. So. Um, yeah, you uh, you found the uh, shittiest agent in the world and uh, got us on a team. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into that in a second. I think one what of the was, big... what was his name again? I could... Hunter. Hunter. Hunter Deal was. I his probably name. can still find him on my WhatsApp. Uh, I don't think he's an agent anymore. Can't figure out why. But was he even an agent? We'll get into that in a second. Conspiracy theory. We got lots of things to talk about today. I, I think one of the big things that brought you to Sweden, and I know we talked about it a lot, was that you wanted to travel. You had done really a lot of traveling. You're uh, born in Ontario. Lived in Kelowna, spent time. Uh, I lived in Vancouver, Kelowna, uh, Toronto for like around all the same amount of time. So, um, and then I played hockey in Michigan, uh, Oklahoma, um, different areas of Canada. Uh, always like traveling. So like that was uh, when they told me I couldn't travel. I realized, wow, I really want to go traveling right now. <laughs> Funny how that works. <laughs> yeah. Um, and. I think at this I think at this time everyone was not really sure what was going on in the world, um, but Sweden was open. And I, my I know my mom was personally was like, "How do you feel about that? Like, do you feel safe?" And I was like, "Honestly, I don't I don't think I'm gonna care about I don't really care that much. I just want to play hockey because I don't have any many more years. So uh, if I die, I die." <laughs> and we had a code twenty three nineteen in the house. <laughs> the Monsters Inc. Monsters Incorporated. There's a saying if you're from Toronto: "Toronto's big, but bigger is better." Shout out to Bigger Saskatchewan. B-I-G-G-A-R. Bigger Saskatchewan. The, uh, not residential. The rural community. Rural. Of, <laughs> rural minis- uh, unincorporated municipality. <laughs> if you're one of the two people in Bigger that somehow listen to this podcast, Toronto is big, but Bigger is better. They already know that. But, yeah. uh, and I think there's also a swastika Saskatchewan. Is that actually a place? Yeah. Th- th- yeah, there's like 
the oh, there's some weird names in uh, in Canada. There's a dildo, somewhere. D- dildo Newfoundland. Yeah, <laughs> um, Saint Louis de Haha <laughs> in Quebec. Yeah. Um, there's a, I think there's a Nazi, or something along that. Like, there's a lot of weird ones. And it was kissing in Africa. It's a country in Africa. Head jumping, head smashing buffalo head. Yes, I've heard about that. In the uh, it, just just outside of uh, Red Deer, right? Uh, Lethbridge. Lethbridge. Somewhere me. around there. Somewhere in southern Alberta. Yeah, they would hunt the buffalo. They'd throw them off the cliff, and then yeah, you run them off the cliff. And then yeah, some small young boy got his head smashed in by a buffalo, and they called it head smashed in by buffalo. <laughs> what an original <laughs> name. They're very, very literal with their names. <laughs> I can't think of anything to name it. What should we call it? Well, my son got his head smashed in by a buffalo. I love it. Perfect. Anyways, uh, shout out to VIU quickly with the dozers. Yes, the, the VIU special, as Sweden's like to call it. We talked about this in Sweden. The uh, Coca-Colas are dozers, and the Pepsis are posers. We're a Coca-Cola, well, we were a Coca-Cola team, and this is a Coca-Cola household. Also, shout out to my woman who is uh, at work, working hard, and has allowed us to uh, come into the apartment for quite possibly the most unprofessional podcasting setup on the show today. The, the couch is twisted. I can hear the construction outside. I hope maybe they'll take the bin away again. I'm hoping that the garbage can guy comes by and he starts like thrashing around and get that like one little piece of gum in the corner out. I hope someone gets in a fight again outside your place. <laughs> yeah, I forgot to, uh, I mentioned that. I was uh, home by myself a couple days ago and I hear some yelling and screaming outside the, you know, the street and I look outside and there's, uh, there's you know one old Asian dude and one young Asian dude and they're yelling at each other like face to face pointing at each other about to throw down. So what did I do? I grabbed my phone and started filming it. And then what happened after that? Um, you were burning something on the stove. No, I yelled at them, hey. I'm oh, they fl- saw fighting. Yeah, they got back in their cars immediately, actually. Yes, because I yelled at them, hey, you should stop fighting because I'm filming this. And they said, well, he doesn't know how to drive. And then they went back into the cars on their way. And then I realized I was burning my dinner. So uh, maybe I can find the video still and put it on the, uh, on the video version of the podcast. But back to it. Uh, is this sweet. a hockey podcast? <laughs> we're, we're trying to keep it a hockey podcast. The ADHD is an incredible drug. But so we go to Sweden, we get set up. The agent that uh, I had found, who was now your agent at the time, I played with a guy in Columbus at the River Dragons Fed Camp, who his best friend at the camp, or one of his friends, uh, introduced me to this agent. He said, I can get you some places. We'll see what happens. Okay, great. He told me I was crazy in uh, April of 2020. I told him, I said, I think the world's going to you know, shut down and, and be that way for a while. I, I think we should sign the Sweden offer because he says, hey, we got a Sweden offer. And, and then he told me, we could sit on it, we could wait on it. Maybe we could sign something in college. We'll find something for you. And I said, no, 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 we're, we're going to sign this. Sweden's wide open. Turns out, great idea. And then I told you, hey, I got this opportunity to go play in Sweden. You should come with me. Mostly because I have no friends. But I think this would be a great opportunity to have a friend with me. We could go travel the world together. And also, you're the only guy on the team at VIU that didn't uh, bully, harass, and uh, make fun of me. And it was kind of nice. Not to get too dark on you. But so I told you. You ended up coming over. I come to Flemingsburg, and they, they set us up in the, the tool shed, the uh, the love shack, as you called it. Yeah. We called it. I'm still waiting for that merch to come out. <laughs> there's um, so there's a tool shed in Sweden in uh, Tullinge. It's like a it's like a car- it's like a carriage house almost, but like it's the size of a tool shed. Basically, so a gentleman by the name of Anders owns this house, and in the back part of the property, way back in the bushes, there's a tool shed, which is the best way to to describe it, and it was renovated. To basically house you know, one bedroom, no doors, no blinds, a little couch, and a tiny ass fridge. Smallest washing machine of our entire life. With no dryer. Dry everything outside in the winter. On the uh, that was getting really tough by the time we were leaving. By the time we left, it was cold. It was like, oh, we got to do laundry in the first like three hours of the afternoon, otherwise it's going to be frozen forever. But so we go to the tool shed, and we're told this place is going to be five hundred dollars a month. Slowly turns into a thousand dollars a month when we showed up there. And then I remember Andres comes in one day and says, "Hey boys, I have a." Uh, a coffee cup and uh, some pens for you. By the way, rent is fifteen hundred dollars a month. Yeah, I, I don't know where that all got lost in translation, but uh, uh, Hunter, I, mean, I, I hate to say it to you, buddy, but uh, five hundred dollars is a lot different than fifteen hundred dollars, and I don't know how you mix that up. You forgot the one on top of the five, but the the pictures that uh, we were, well, at least that I was sent to the place, were night and day different from what we actually looked. Oh, oh man, well, you, you, I think you're also forgetting is like. They said that we had a place, then you show up, oh, we don't have a place, I had to find this last second here. Um, and then, like, oh, my car broke down, I couldn't, I can't pick you up from the airport. Uh, driving the car to the rink the next day, it's completely fine. That was a different excuse, though, because what I got, now to, to rewind, I had gotten off the plane in Germany uh, to go to fly over to Stockholm from Munich, and I was told uh, by coach he was going to pick us up. Worst case, he's going to find somebody else to pick us up. 
Now I'm asking for the address of where we're going to live. And I never got the address. And then I land in Germany. I said, hey, what's the deal? I, you know, I'm two hours away from coming over. And he says, oh, you're going to have to find your own way to get to the place. By the way, here's the address. I can't pick you up. And I remember telling you that and thinking, oh, my God, this is going to be interesting. We've just done our first ever European voyage. We're tired, jet lagged, and we have to commute what would be about two, two and a half hours by commuter train and the bus to find a place that we've never been to with no Wi-Fi, with no service. No, What an endeavor it was. I, well, I think we talked about this after. It's like, I don't think you could have done what I had to do to get to the, to the place. So I get off, obviously, no cell service, new country, um, no address. Um, Did I not give you the address? Well, no, I got it later, but I had to get, I had to get, I didn't have the, I didn't have the address when I landed. I didn't, I only got the address um, uh, after I, um, I, got, I took after I took the train down to Flemingsburg and just got off at the station I thought I would have to get off at, and then tried to figure out where the buses were, and uh, was and uh, got someone to personal hotspot me at the bus stop. Some random Swedish guy. Yeah. Well, so yeah, I had no idea of what I was doing. I just got out of Arlanda Airport and I took the train down, and I'm just going through all the all the towns, and I'm like, okay, there's Flemingsburg. I know I have to be here. Um, I know I have to get off here. I get off the train and, um, and I have all my stuff. And, oh, I should actually mention, not my, a lot of my stuff was left in London. So I didn't have a hockey bag, hockey sticks, and most of my clothes. I had my camera backpack uh, and two duffel bags. And um, I'm carrying my, my duffel bag through the train station and I feel a little tug on my bag. And uh, I turn around and a gypsy... Uh, is literally opening my bag and trying to steal stuff out of my bag and I f- rip it away. I'm like, are you f- joking me? You s- uh, I said a lot of really sh- mean things to this lady because I was pretty pissed off. But uh, I was smart enough to know that uh, keep the passport, wallet, and all the belongings in the front around my hand because like, I've already been traveling in Europe and I'd already, uh, I played in, uh, hockey in the Czech Republic for a very, very quick amount of time back in the day. And I, so I learned all about uh, gypsies in Europe. Um, so I was like, okay, let's just prepare for the worst. And of course that happened. That was the one experience I had though with that. Um, get off there, go to the bus, hotspot, get, call you, get the address, uh, get a text from coach, take the bus, walk around the area trying to figure out what house it is, knock on a do- someone's door. I was like, hey, I'm looking for this address. I have no idea where I'm going. And it's like 10 o'clock at night. Um, and... Uh, then I finally find the place and Anders is like grumpy at me and I, he's like, oh, the place is in the back. And he's like, why did you, why did you call Travis? So I'm like, I don't have cell service. I just got here. I don't have a phone plan. But I did that all by myself. Could you imagine yourself, could you imagine yourself doing that? Because at this point you weren't, uh, you were the, the grumpy traveler. Yes, I was the grumpy traveler. I was very fortunate though because all the people that had reached out and messaged me previously about the Swedish sign, I'm like, hey, if you ever need anything, let me know. Shout out to Big Save Dave. Well, Dave messaged me literally as I got into the airport and in Munich and said, do you need anything? I said, yeah, how about a ride? Done, I'll be there in 45 minutes. Yeah, well, um, so he lives, what, two hours away from Flemingsburg? So yeah, he, um, he, drove all the, he drove all the way to drop you off and he's such a, be- I still talk to that guy every now and then. Same, same, with, uh, same with Dan. Yeah, Dave Gunnaby, Big Save Dave is what we call him. And reason being is that he lives two hours outside of Stockholm. He drove all the way to the Orlando airport, picked me up, brought a uh, Trav Suck sign just so that I knew that it was him. Picked me up, drove me to the place, dropped off my stuff, to the arena, dropped off the gear, back to the place. And this was life-changing because I remember getting off the plane in Sweden, thinking to myself, my God, like I don't know if I can do this for more than like three hours. Like I am just fatigued. And then enter jet lag first every time being exposed to it and then you start realizing okay this is how you kind of fix it maybe sleep in the plane eat a little bit better hydrate a little bit better and i don't know how i did it but and there's me crushing the free bottles of wine the entire time yeah the all you can drink special <laughs> bottomless red wine man that was the quickest flight of my life <laughs> Air Canada was like yeah we're just giving away bottles of wine we have way too many take as many as you want <laughs> just crushing wine for the first hour and a half socked yeah we ordered way too many bottles of wine in february 2020 and we are eating it now literally <laughs> But so we ended up getting to uh, Flemingsburg. First couple practices, no pegs, zero. They wouldn't give me pegs. Do you remember that? I, I just couldn't, I, honestly, I just couldn't believe that um, they had no pegs in the rink and they told you that. Like, Matt, Matt you think Hockey Night in Canada is pissed at Matt Murray? 
Wait till they go to Flemingsburg. Matt Murray 2023 is struggling and having a tough time getting the pegs to stand place for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Trevi and Travis Ridgen for the Flemingsburg HK, IK Hockey Club. IK. IK, in, for, yeah. IK in Stockholm, Sweden in 2020 when they would not give me the pegs. So I remember asking Coach, do we have any pegs? Because he's, you know the net keeps falling over. And he said, uh, no, we don't have any pegs. Because he had uh, the Russian accent. I know he was Czech, but he sounded Russian. And so I thought, okay. I'll ask the goalie coach. And he says, no, they don't really give us pegs. Okay. So I go to ask the Zamboni guy. Didn't speak any English. So I got no pegs. And then all of a sudden we go to play a game. Peg showed up. So I knew there was pegs in the building. And it made practices very difficult, obviously, not having them. But as we have uh, ventured to learn in all the pro hockey, both in you know Motor City, Flemingsburg, Varberg. Actually, no, Varberg was the exception. We had a fantastic ice staff. Oh, rink. your rink was great, too. Great rink. We had three Zamboni drivers who worked full-time. They kept the place in tip-top running order. The best ice I've ever skated in my life. If you wanted it, ask the question, done. It was always delivered. I, I always like to think that the rinks, the first rink we played in, in comparison to the rinks that we went to after, nine day. Now, mine was an older barn, but it was also an Allsvenskan rink. And it was, so we would, yeah, we would get like eight, not in COVID times, but we get like eight, 900 people at our games uh, usually. And then, um, which looks empty in a rink that's You're seats. talking about Coruscant. Yeah, uh, which looks empty with uh, 4,000 plus seats. But um, that was such a sick barn and so cool. Uh, but yours was new and that, it looked unreal. Sounds kind of like the uh, Motor City Rock. Also, it had like the net dropping down. That was cool as hell. Yeah, the net drop down shot was really nice. We, yeah, we, we had a fantastic setup in, in Varberg. I, I, I missed a lot. I was talking to one of the guys, Wojtek. I know you played with him yeah. in uh, uh, I did Well, he played for a team that I played for later. Okay. Yeah, but um, shout out to uh, Sean Worth. He wants a shout out for the Bradford Rattlers. Yep, there you go. There's a shout out for the Rattlers. But uh, I was talking to Wojtek not too long ago. I said, I know you're in Division Two. You moved up. You're making more money now. But do you ever miss the Division Three Varberg days? And he says, yep. And Travis, we had a good team. It was a lot of fun. I miss it. And I said, yeah, I miss it too. I miss it too. But so anyway, so we ended up playing games. And the first ever rink we went into in Sweden, concrete floors. Oh, the tile floor. Yeah, the tile floors. I was just thinking about that. And everyone, was, I, we'd have skate guards. And Nobody I, told us. No one told us. And they're like, oh, what do you, what do you have back home in Canada? Rubber. <laughs> Like walkable floors? Walkable floors. The thing, that little strip you put on before we go on the ice, we have that for the whole arena, believe it or not. Yeah, apparently it's too expensive in Sweden to do that. So even even though um, even though um, right by where Dave lives, there's a plastic and rubber producing plant I heard. So it's like, it's not, it can't be that expensive. It's lack of effort and laziness. You guys could have done it. But, so we had no skate guards. Yeah, but Car Sloga had rubber. We had rubber. Well, you got the VIP treatment. But so we ended up fleecing the Zamboni driver in, um, uh, what was the place called? Uh, Vast, not Vigby, home. Vigby Home? Vigby Home. Vigby Home, yep. So the Zamboni driver says, I got two pairs of skate guards. Here you go, gentlemen. Yeah, he gave you one. He gave me one. He comes in after the game. He said, where's the skate guards? He said, oh, I brought them back. I did not bring them back because I knew we were going to deal with more arenas that had the concrete. So I said, I'm just going to hold on to these and we'll. I kept them, but I hated them. Those were the ones that with like the little hook thing that you put on the back and they would always fall off my skates. European stuff. Figure skater uh, skate guards. Yeah, yeah. I wish we should have invested in uh, one of those uh, rollerblade ones that the kids wear nowadays. I was still waiting for my sticks to show up in Flemingsburg. I don't know when You're the You're still cards. waiting. I'm still waiting. It's been two um, years. Yeah. Uh, Flemingsburg, can we please have our sticks? <laughs> so in my, in my contract, in my deal with Flemingsburg, was that I was going to get CCM sticks paid for by the team. How many? I don't know, but they never showed up. And I remember, if you remember, the first game, uh, tough one, first real game in a couple of years. I think I gave up like eight goals and 30 shots. Second game... Brought my A game, three goals and 50 shots. Save of the year. Save of the year, kept the boys in it. And I said to coach after the game, hey, coach, how about those sticks? Because I, I thought I just kept us in the game. We just lost by one goal. I it think. was like 45 shots. Uh, yeah, 45, 48, whatever it was, three goals. Yeah, somebody will find it in the YouTube archives. And so I asked coach, where's my where's my sticks? Can I get my sticks? And he says, you stop one more puck, we can talk. Sticks still haven't shown up. I'm still waiting on them. I still want my sticks. Nobody got six. No one's. No one got six. I didn't even get a helmet <laughs> or a visor. Well, we did get a couple things, but that was only when we left. Which to tell that story. So fast forward uh, three games. I should pause there. We also played with an NHL player on our team. We did, Dima Timoshov. Yeah, Dima Timoshov, who plays uh, at the time was the Red Wings. Yeah, but he plays in Sweden now. But I can't remember if it's all Svenskan or SHL. But he does play in Sweden now. Bring us um, in the SHL now. Pardon? Brinus in the SHL now. Uh, Brinus? Okay, yeah. They're uh, not looking so hot, though. They voted relegation, I believe. I could be wrong. At least last year they did. And then before that, he's the New York Islanders, Wings, and then Leafs. Yeah. Um, yeah, he um, 
a couple of my friends, uh, Demo, oh, when he was playing, for, when I, this is when I was living in Toronto still, Demo uh, slid into the DMs. <laughs> Oh, females we're talking about. Yeah, so oh, okay. into the DMs okay. of uh, uh, some of my uh, female friends. And uh, I, I showed them a couple of the DMs. Like, oh, yeah, I remember that person. Oh, I, I said that. Hey, shoot or shoot? Shoot or shoot. And uh, when you have uh, Toronto Maple Leafs in your bio, it helps a lot. Well, I heard. Well, when you have the picture of, hey, here's me wearing that Maple Leaf crest, it does a lot of time. <laughs> Not the beer league. <laughs> it's very true. But Not I will say, in practicing with him for a month, because obviously he wasn't playing anymore because of the, the you know COV season over here. I've never played with somebody who I've never seen lose the puck one time. I remember one time very specifically in um, uh, Han- 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 Haninga. Haninga? That team, Haninga. Uh, yeah, yeah. Four guys on him in the corner. Dim- Dimitro Timoshov. Four guys on him in the corner, and he walked the phone booth. like He was you know, sticking out on the phone booth and just walked out. Incredible. Uh- yeah, we would go to like games, and like he, he would bring his like friends out like that played in like Austria or like or in um, uh, the American. Uh, just bring them out, and they were just like uh, they, when they wanted to try, they were just so good out there. But they just didn't give a shit, and actually probably hurt the team more. That's true. Lots of pizzas that all you can eat special. There's a couple yeah. couple times I think they nasty big that team Devo has the biggest quads I've ever seen on a human being. Huge legs. Huge legs. Man meat. Yeah, I thought I thought I had big legs, and then I saw him, and I was very humbled. And uh, we found out really quickly what it takes to be an NHL player. You ever remember when he tried to sell me his apartment? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but buddy, I can't I can't afford the National League budget. <laughs> he's talking about going back to North America, and he's like, "Yeah, I need someone to look after my apartment." No, 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 no. He was looking to sell it. Now, now oh. tell a story. Post practice, me and Sweeney sit together in the locker room. Dima Tro, or Dima sits right across from us. And he says to us, he says, hey, Trav, are you looking for a place that's better than your current one? I said, absolutely. What do you think? And he's like, well, I need to get rid of my current apartment. You can have it. And then it turned out it was $3,300 a month. So that was out of the budget, significantly out of the budget. Yeah, also in downtown Stockholm. That's very true. I'm sure yeah. it was a beautiful place. Yeah. But uh, I believe it was right by uh, Mr. French. If, you know, if you're from the Stockholm area, you know what I'm talking about. Trav doesn't. Trav's not a bar star. I didn't spend a lot of time in uh, Stockholm, out in the village, more, more so in the Gothenburg area, but... Yeah. Yeah, because you finally grew up and decided that traveling is fun. I did. I realized a lot of things once we left. You imagine and... if you actually spent time in Stockholm, how much like more you would have like appreciated Sweden that much more? Because like that is the major city, and like Gothenburg is an unbelievable city, and I love visiting there. But it's like um, you would have been to like all the major cities in like major major cities in Sweden at that point and really explored them. Well, I tried to last year, or I guess the year before. Uh, like when I did go to Stockholm to see Jesper Wallstedt, I tried to kind of explore a little bit. I was like, I need to make up for lost time. And we'll get to that in a second. But so we play three, four games in Flemingsburg. All of a sudden, oh, your player agent or your transfer fees aren't ready. Your transaction cards, your transfer cards aren't ready. You can't play. Well, they'll be coming shortly. And then me and you start thinking, hmm, it's interesting. They're bringing other players, bringing other goalies. We're not ready to play. We can't dress. Interesting. Hmm. And then, God bless him, my current agent to this day, Adrian Soon. Who I was going to use originally before I went with Hunter. Yes. And Sooner cold calls me, never spoken to him in my life, and says, hey, I've been watching the vlog. Keep in mind the vlog is a couple weeks behind. Uh, I think you guys are getting scammed. And then we waited like a week, and then we got scammed. I I think it was less than that. It was a couple days. Yeah, it was was really quick. And um, I had a a feeling because I was like, uh, I actually met Adrian in Ontario, so I had already known him for a few years. and he tried to get me a contract in the UK, but I went to school instead. Um, but yeah, he was like, oh, sweet. how's the, oh, I didn't know you were on the, uh, on the vlog and in Sweden, what, how's it going? And uh, I just talked to him and he's like, he's like, wanted to talk to you immediately. Cause he's like, you're, a, you're a, he's like, go look up uh, your agent on Facebook and tell me if he looks like an agent. <laughs> no. And it was at that moment we realized we were in trouble. And so anyway, so fast forward a couple of days, Adrian says we're getting scammed. What are we going to do? Well, we got to move out of the place we're at currently and get into a hotel or something. I, I found the Motel L. God bless Yeah, it. we had to pack up really quick. And uh, at the time, Trav uh, was packing this really, really shitty Joe Boxer underwear. And not, now he has the beautiful sponsor for today, Sheath Underwear. The amazing team of Sheath Underwear. I packed up all my sheaths and I brought them down from Stockholm, Sweden, in the Flemingsberry area to the Motel L. Now, let me tell you about Sheath Underwear. This is why we were able to escape Sweden. And I'll tell you why. The bamboo cooling mesh keeps you cool, keeps you comfortable, especially on those hot summer days. And their dual pouch technology that separates the twig and the biscuit, keep the boys aerated, compartmentalized, and segregated so they can breathe so you don't have like a bat wing stuck to the side of your leg. You don't want to have that mouse trap 
all bundled up together. You want to have that nice and compartmentalized. Again, and Sheath Underwear does that. And if you're on the video version of the podcast, there's a link in the video description. You click that at sheathunwear.com. You use the promo code BISCUIT69, B-I-Z-K-I-T-6-9. Can't forget it. And it'll get you 20% off the best underwear that money can buy. Only Sheath Underwear. If you're on the Apple or Spotify version, just stop, pull over whenever you get a chance to do so. In the podcasting notes, there's a link there as well. And again, that BISCUIT69 code will save you a couple bucks on the best underwear, underwear money can buy. I guarantee if you try Sheath, you will love it. Can't not love it. It's amazing. Still Incredible. waiting for my pair. Well, you are one of the competitors, yeah. and it's why you're sweating so much today. We're going to get you comfortable. Yeah. We're going to get you in a pair of sheaths. It's on my to-do list. Right. My mom just got a pair uh, of sheaths maybe like two weeks ago. She loves it. it. took me six months to get her a pair because I kept forgetting. But yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm still waiting for my Ridge wallet from the Stockholm sponsorships. I'm behind the ball in a lot of things these days. I'm trying to catch up. But So anyway, so uh, we have to escape the uh, Love Shack, and we call it the Love Shack because no love would ever be made in this premises because there's no doors. No blinds. Everybody could see it. And Sweden's lost rock, paper, scissors for the bed. That's true. It's very, very, very true. I lost every game of rock, paper, scissors when we were together, except for who got the bed and who got the couch. Because that was the only two places to sleep. Uh, You won another one that was important. You only won two games. You lost every single one. I won one for not doing the dishes, but that's another story for another day. So anyway, so we have to escape. And remember you said, eh, we should just move to the hotel, leave our gear at the rink. And I said, no, 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 no. We are getting out of here. And God bless Anders, our uh, landlord at the time. He, him and his wife had gone out for the weekend. And so I said, you know what? We're going to pack everything up. We're going to leave tomorrow. So pack All that big save, Dave. Yep. Packed up everything that night. The next morning, you and I took the uh, public transit, took the bus to the train station, train over to the uh, Motel L. And it was about a, I don't know, about a 45 minute, an hour commute each, like each segment. So it was two hours, two and a half each way or each compartment. I wish we got the vlog footage of you climbing over the cage. We'll get in there in a sec. <laughs> So we move everything to the hotel from our current living situation. We made sure we clean up the place, left it tip top just in case something bad happened. And then Big Save Dave comes in and we say, let's go to the rink. We go to the rink. Now, the day before, two days before, the equipment manager had put or had been trying to put all my equipment in a uh, storage unit, like a storage locker. And I said, don't do that because I have you know, my balls, my lacrosse bands or my lacrosse balls, my exercise bands. I don't want them being put away. And so we come into the arena. And, you know, on brand with what we had suspected, my bag and a lot of my stuff had been put away in a storage unit. And a couple of my, my pieces were hanging up in the, in the room. And I immediately thought, shit, where is my stuff? And then I remember asking, somebody said, oh, there's a, a storage unit to the, uh, I guess, the south side of the building. So I go to the Zamboni driver who didn't speak any English. I just kind of use like sign language and then Google Translate with him. Comes over, unlocks the room, unlocks the, uh, uh, like the, uh, the cage that everything was in. I climb this metal cage, I'm sinking all the way in. I grab my VIU Mariner's bag, pull it out, and then boom, we got our bag, load up the equipment. You didn't even bring your bag because I guess you left it at the hotel, so you carried everything out by hands, the skates and the shin pads. And we made our way out to the hotel. We were camped out for the next 10 days before I well, found I, my team, and you were only there for a day. Yeah. You found uh, your one team. Yeah, forwards are a lot easier to find uh, a new job. Significantly easier, especially as an import goalie. But you did find a team in Carl Skoga, and like you mentioned, kind of like the... They uh, were so good. Kind of like the Motor City Rockers, though. Home of uh, 4,000 seats, and you're only filling about you know eight to 900. Yeah, well, I mean, when you're competing with an Alsvenskan team in town... It is tricky. Or if you're competing yeah. with the uh, the Pistons or the Lions. Or we, the were, we were really good, though. Um, they were... Um, in the promotion playoffs the year before, before their season got shut down, we probably would have done it again. That team was really, really good um, for Division Two. Um, what was it, the team? Monkfords was the top team in that area, and Almost. Um, those would be the two teams that we would have uh, had to really compete with for promotion. There was, yeah, but we were good. And I had so much fun there. I remember I posted a snap story one day of me uh, in O'Leary's in Karlskoga. Um, Lost and there, well, I mean, this one is like the because Karskoga is a smaller town, um, uh, rel- in Canadian terms, is thirty five thousand people. Um, that was the spot people used to go out to, um, and I was just on the dance floor dancing. There was like probably like three hundred people in the bar, and I remember people were replying to my story, "Where the hell are you right now? What are you doing?" And I was like, "Oh, I'm in Sweden." They're like, "You can do that there? Yes, I can do whatever I want." The world's open over yeah, here. Yeah, and uh, these they were like, they were like, "That's." Uh, that that's so weird don't you feel scared out there i'm like i don't know man i'm having fun right now i'm paying 14 dollars for a falcon right now at the bar i'm having a great time that's the worst beer i've ever had in my life listen kevin turn the cbc off keep watching my snapstat snapchat stories 
But that was basically the end of your hockey career and our time together because shortly after that, uh, fast forward, I don't know, two, three weeks, the COV kind of ran its course and shut everybody down. We got sent home and you have continued on the uh, full-time career path of filmmaking and I have continued mucking out the uh, the trenches of the feds, you know, in Motor City. Uh, I, I Honestly, I wish I knew that my last game actually was going to be that last game. I got hurt my last game. Oh, the, uh, the, the game we got blown out 13-2. No, uh, this was when I was in Kalskoga. Uh, but I, I, I had joint problems in my wrist for like, since I was like probably like 18 years old, uh, and it just re-aggravated that injury, and I had to actually go to uh, get X-rays done because like I really fucked up the joints there. I couldn't even like bend my hand, and that was the end of the career. We were we were done the season uh, two weeks later. That was it. Yeah, um, yeah. I kind of wish I knew that that was my last game, um, but uh, yeah. Uh, now I'm have a full time job. Full time filmmaking career. Yeah, uh, I went actually. I did a couple of years as like working uh, in the bar industry uh, and doing like 60, 80 hour weeks, juggling the the bar industry and trying to you know grow a business. And uh, I went full time in the fall, and it was probably the coolest, best decision I ever made. And now I actually end up started to do YouTube stuff <laughs> technically. Full circle. Yeah. Um, so yeah, now I'm doing working with a couple brands, and then next weekend I'm shooting my first uh, music festival. I'm really pumped about it. That's awesome. So people wondering, that's what he's doing. He's not playing hockey anymore, and he's shooting for for send season. Yeah, I do. Uh, actually, I gotta talk about that. The one kid that came up to me at one of the events in Edmonton. What was his uh, What was his name? I promised uh, him a shout on the podcast if you listened. We'll fi- we'll figure it out in, in a bit, but yeah. I think his name is Connor. I got his Instagram down there. But anyways, uh, the guy uh, recognized me from the Sweden vlogs. <laughs> Two years later. Yeah, he's like, he just comes up to me. He's like, Liam Sweeney. And I'm like, oh, oh, this is just some like, oh, I guess you watch my videos. He says, he's like, I remember you watching you on the Trav 4 vlogs in Sweden. I'm like, no way. No way I get recognized in Edmonton at an event I'm working just because of your vlog. Yep, small world. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Now, to rewind though, we met because of the VAU Mariners. Now, do you remember our first conversation with the Mariners? I do. Um, our actual first conversation? Any conversation for our first communication line. Uh, I remember you complaining that you couldn't, that you got lost on the run. I don't No, No, you roasted me in the group chat when they made the group chat within the first day. Oh, what did I say? I, did I actually roast you? Yes. I mean, uh, what did I do? I, I can't remember the exact wording of it, but I, I had made some comment in the group chat and you had said something along the lines of, it's okay, Trav, not all of us can make YouTube videos full time. And that was it. And then you texted me, per, or you texted me personally. And then we ended up uh, communicating a little bit. And then shortly after that, we did the VIU run where I got lost in the woods and was 30 minutes later than everybody else. And I had the slowest marathon time because this body was built for hot dogs and power. And oh, was- my. Well, t- Trav came in at 240. 236. 236. And uh, you want to tell them why you came in at 236? Because I bulked all summer and I ate croissants with Nutella. And I crushed a lot of them. A week before, Trav uh, wants to carb up because you have more energy. Chocolate-filled uh, croissants is... Nutella croissants. <laughs> which, funny enough, is only three pounds heavier than I am right now. I'm 233 right yeah, now. Yeah, but you don't look like a milk bag like you did back oh, then. thank you very much. We, well, the weight has to come off at some point. Yeah, you, you, looked, you, you looked better in January when you weren't playing than the beginning of the season. I'd practiced probably four times the, the entire season up to that point in January. Yeah, I guess those prime workouts were working. That's, that's true. That's true. Our, our goalie coach, do you ever remember uh, Chris Carter? Of course I do. How can you forget the guy? He's selling houses now. Oh, you, know, you know, Chris Carter, our goalie coach, very nice guy. I, I remember every, uh, every practice we, we'd talk about, you know, different goalie coaching things. You know, he was heavily influenced by Mitch Korn, like a lot of goalie coaches are. But uh, he would spend a lot of time talking about uh, his full-time job, how he'd work get up at three in the morning, start work at four, work till, you know, whatever hours it was, six, seven PM at night, and then come skate with us. And, and, uh, I can't remember much goalie coaching that actually took place with the Mariners. I just don't, I, I can't get over the fact, um, that like the coaching staff there did like nothing to bring people up. Like you or I, it was always bring us down and they would do stuff to bring me up. But like for you specifically, all they would do is like bring you down um, and I just like, just from on, not, not just like a coaching level, but like a human level, like, why would you just put your energy into doing that? Um, like why, like what goalie coach thinks it's a good idea to go roast his goalie when he's having a talk? I don't even know where to begin with that. I mean, 
I, I was frustrated because I remember when, when I came off with the recruiting trip, as we, you know, I talked about in a previous episode, but there was no coaching staff. I talked to Steve Paul. You know, we went through the grades, all, all this stuff, and accepted to school, come for the recruiting trip, and nobody was there. The only people out there were Miles, our owner, Miles Parsons, and Chris Carter, our goalie coach. No other member of the coaching staff was there at all. I remember Miles taking me for you know, breakfast after the morning skate at you know, 6 or 7 a.m., whatever it was. And he says, I, listen, Trevor, I'm really sorry that Steve didn't show up. I'm sorry, I'm sorry that nobody showed up, and I really feel bad. This is a terrible experience. This is our first ever recruit trip we've done for anybody because it was the first year of the program. And I said, well, actually, I kind of like it here. It's a beautiful place. Come from Winnipeg. The weather's, you know, doesn't get any worse. And then here is warm winters. Doesn't get any better. I would like to play here. And he says, well, I think I have a letter of intent back at the, you know, the rink. You want to sign it? I was like, yeah, sure. Miles was not at any of the practices. He just, you know, picked me up and dropped me off a couple of times. So he'd never seen me. I had no idea what he was getting. Sign a letter or whatever. It's on the uh, the VIU website, on the BCI website. I'm sure Steve P must have blown a gasket, you know, hemorrhage, hemorrhage stroke. After he saw that uh, I'd been signed, he's like, I've never seen this guy before. Well, I signed him. But so uh, moving from Winnipeg to Nanaimo, bringing my girlfriend at the time, who obviously no longer together, um, and then being told, hey, you know, the starting position's open. Our goalies the year before weren't very good. And then there's a very good chance that you could take the position. And then I thought I did pretty well, all things considered, in the uh, training camp, still do. Um, and then being told you're going to be the third guy, you practice once a week and you get shots when the other guys tell you you should be. And the part that I found the most confusing was the guy behind me, the fourth string goalie, Riley Matheson. Shout out, shout out to, uh, you know, Mr. Pickles, as I called him. He was the best goalie on the team. By far. Like, he was unbelievable. And he was the fourth goalie on he the team. He single-handedly almost led his team to a VI, uh, JHL championship, the Junior B League. He blew it in Game 7. But, but <laughs> like he was unbelievable. he was he- massive. Same size as me, but a little bit wider. Yeah, and he moved really well, like very smooth. Um, and then like his one opportunity he got the for the. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. We'll yeah. get to that in a second. Like like uh, the Stevie P couldn't figure out why uh, why Trav and Riley uh, were rusty. Well, well, we'll get to that in a second. Do you remember the comment that Steve made to you on the power about the power play on the bench? Do you want to tell that story real quick? Oh, oh um, I got another story like that. He's like, I don't know, I'm, maybe I'm just retarded. I do remember that. But I, I remember also, um, this was against SFU, um, and uh, Gavin Rouser and Dylan McCann, I believe they uh, always kill penalties together or something like that. And he just changed his PK lines just out of nowhere. And Gavin's like, why, why, are, you, what are, you, why are you doing that? And he's like, oh, I don't know, I'm fucked. <laughs> That, that was the most DVP thing I've ever seen. I remember <laughs> he, he called a timeout to go take a pee. Oh. <laughs> he wasted our timeout to go take a piss. <laughs> Welcome to the Mariners. <laughs> I still can't get over a coach taking a piss with two minutes left because, in the game because he had to go to the washroom. <laughs> if that isn't some of our time with the VAU Mariners, I don't know what does. I remember he brought me into the, he pulled me into the office one day and he says to me, he's like, I just want to talk about your game for a second. And I'm like, great. I've just had you know, our goalie coach, Chris Carter, although him and I have had some okay personal conversations. He's been shitting on me in the last, I don't know, two months. And Steve pulls me in the office. And I'm like, okay, great. Maybe somebody's recognized my hard work, and I know we're getting blown out 8-1, 7 nothing, a lot, couple games. Maybe I'll get a chance. And he calls me in the office, and he says, you know, you ever thought of playing more like Billy Ranford? <laughs> I'm, I'm not exaggerating, Sweeney. He literally <laughs> called me, and he says, to me, says that to me. And I said, why do you say that? He said, well... I actually played with Billy Ranford, but the Brandon Weekings back in the day, and obviously we EP'd, you know, Stevie P. And what did we find? Quebec senior hockey. He never played with Billy Ranford. My dad actually went to school with Billy Ranford. True story. They're both from Brandon, but he's telling me to play like Billy Ranford, and I said, "What do you like? What do you mean? Like Bill Ranford won the Conn Smythe thirty years ago, Steve?" And he's like, "Well, you know, mix up, you know, a little, little bit of athleticism, stack the pads." I'm like, "It's 2018." Like, have you not talked to your goalie coach about this? And then he shit on me about my work ethic and all this kind of stuff. And there and there was some validity to a lot of the things about my attitude and my, my work ethic yeah, at the time. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. But now fast forward Christmas time, and I believe... Oh, I think the missus is coming home. We Honey, you're... Yeah, we have a new guest. We have a three-way podcast Yeah, we have a three-way podcast now. <laughs> so, uh, Christmas time for the VAU Mariners. And I remember uh, Clark or Huber were supposed to first start the first two games back against uh, UVic. And they call me and say, hey, listen, uh, they're not going to be back in time for Christmas. You're going to start one of the first two games back. I'm like, great. You and Matheson get a game. So we ended up talking. I got the first game on the road. And then he got the one at home. 
And obviously at the time, I'm practicing once a week. I get shots whenever the other two guys tell me I can. It's tough to stay sharp under those circumstances. Going to a game, I, I had a good first period. I think I went in one goal on 10 shots, played well. Second period fell apart. I remember the, the shot off Daryl Senholt's foot firing its way from behind the goal line, and that kind of opened up the waterfall for uh, the poor goals that were to follow it. But anyway, uh, I get the yank, four goals on 20 shots. We're winning 5-4. Stevie P yanks me. And then the next night, Riley Mathis and Mr. Pickles, he gives up four goals on 10 shots. Tough goals, to be honest, if we're being quite fair. And I remember thinking to myself, I felt horrible after, uh, after my first start. I don't know what to do. I really need my work laptop. So well, can we get your laptop? You can get your laptop. <laughs> um, so anyway, he gives the four goals on 10 this shots. This is a professional podcast. I, I told you when we started. This is the... I'm like, nobody stops. So like, I just need... <laughs> just keep going. Keep going. Showed us my beautiful, lovely girlfriend. Uh, Sweets, this is my girl. Oh, she shut the door. Never mind. She didn't want to meet me. Yep. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Pickles gives the four goals on 10 shots. And I remember thinking to myself the night before, thinking, oh my God, dude, like... I have had some dark thoughts in my time. This is probably up there for some of the worst ones because I have uh, gotten one opportunity that I didn't think they were ever going to give me. I pissed it away, and now I'm really going to be buried for the rest of the season, and like never, ever will they ever give me a chance again. And then the guy who's behind me as the fourth goalie, who's supposed to be you know the best goalie in the league, is going to go and dominate the next night. He's going to take over the starting job, what I wanted to do, and it's just going to be a salt in the wounds. And then he does even worse than me. I give him four and he was he, he played so bad. But I felt so bad. I did too. Because he he was such a good dude, but and he was unreal, and I was like he should have probably taken over the starting job. And, and there were some like, I don't know if you remember like I remember two of the four were like really 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 bad goals like sharp angle ice burner, tough tough goals and it didn't look like him. I even remember like seeing what he you know what he looked like at the beginning of the season and obviously I didn't practice with him because I got the one practice with a couple shots he got the other one with a couple shots and it just didn't look like him. And I remember texting him after the game saying hey man. Uh, I hope you're doing okay. I know you're in a tough spot. Uh, let me know if you ever want to talk. Nothing back. Didn't want to talk to me. And that was the last time I ever communicated with him because I didn't see him the rest of the season, I don't think. Because he was, uh, well, I don't know what he was doing, but he was practicing the opposite days of me. Yeah. He, well, he, he was really busy with his program. He was in heavy, like, heavy duty mechanic or something like that. And then he went, he, played, uh, he went to play senior hockey after in Saskatchewan. For one year and then hung up and... I don't know. He, he had one of the hottest girlfriends at the time, too. Well, I mean, speaking of hung up. That's why I called him Mr. Pickles. Yeah, he is uh, hung. A cucumber Let's, in a nutshell. Dude, it's a cucumber. And his <laughs> girlfriend was tiny, and I couldn't figure out how the whole thing worked. I remember one of the guys. Uh, it's like the Piper period with the seven uh, black dudes. I remember one of the guys in the locker room called him the refrigerator one day. I was like, oh, I get it. I get your Okay, it makes sense. But. So that was basically it for the VAU chapter. And then, you know, you and I would hang out, hang out a couple of times as the season went on. And then, Well, do you know why I started doing that? Do you remember? Because you felt bad for me? No. <laughs> why did you hang out? Oh, yeah, because you wanted the film I, project. Because, uh, so I was in digital media at school. So, um, uh, yes, I actually went to school for something I'm doing. And something I didn't actually need to go to school for. Different topic. Um, but I needed uh, help with a video project. And uh, I knew one person to ask. Well, you need somebody with a drone. Yeah, I, I, needed, have I needed drone footage for it. And uh, that, could you imagine carrying around your Phantom with instead of the Mavic now? Times have changed it's like quite a, a bit. Suitcase. It was a big jalopy, and it sounded like an airport like takeoff landing. Like as I, I ended up buying um, the same one after, and it was like one kilometer distance, and I was like, like comparing them flying drones now, it's like how different they are, just like that short amount of time. Yeah, night. It, it's. And game changing, but yeah. that was what really brought us together. We, we'd been eh, acquaintances at that point in time, but then us spending, you know, two straight days together kind of bonded us over the uh, Victoria Golden Trestle, whatever yeah. they called it. And then um, I ended up saying goodbye to VIU. Obviously, uh, uh, I, I told the coaching staff I wasn't going to come back. I wanted to go somewhere else, and I didn't have anything lined up at that point in time. I just knew that I wanted out. And then obviously, I go to the University of Manitoba Bisons. I skipped them for two months. Got released in September. I did really well, I felt. I felt that you know, I put the cameras aside. Things were going really well. Had one bad day, and then see you later. Obviously, was competing against the junior A goalie of the year at that point in time. Jeremy Link, shout out to him. I think he, I could be wrong. I believe he's a starter still at the U of M. Unreal goaltender. And then to the Fed Zeno with the Columbus River Dragons. Tough go. It's not a men's league where they get a couple bucks. It's actually a really good pro league. Lit up. Sent home. Senior hockey. 
tough goal there. I had a good first game, and the second game you have nine goals. Tough goal. Uh, yeah, please don't come back. <laughs> yeah, uh, you can just stop showing up. The gas money will be in the mail. Although the well, two of the three biggest lies in pro hockey is that you're only going down for two weeks, and the checks in the mail. The third one we can't send the podcast because it's not PG. But uh, the check did go in the mail, and I did get, and I did end up getting the gas money, which is nice. But so then fast forward, uh, end of November, beginning of December, 2019. Uh, no team to play on. Uh, my girlfriend at the time, who was beyond furious with me to begin with, that I was leaving VIU because she really loved uh, living in Nanaimo and then going back to Winnipeg, she got a job. And I remember um, uh, I remember her parents took her and I out for, for dinner one time for my birthday, actually, my birthday dinner. And they said, oh, good to see you. I haven't seen you in a couple months since, you know, before the season started. Are you guys going back next year? And then I had to, you know, look her mom in the, in the face and said, actually, I'm going to take a try with the U of M Bisons and hope that it works out. And I, I, I remember the disgust in her face that she wanted to shank me. You move my daughter to Nanaimo and then back here to take a tryout. And that was the beginning of the end. So anyway. John, just like your dad, oh, I can't figure out why this never, uh, my marriages aren't working out. I don't know why. But um, so December of 2019, I'm in a very stable state of mind, as you can imagine at this point in time. And I, ta- I remember talking to Sweens. And I got, actually, this idea did come from uh, Nolan Kruseva, the goalie coach I was working with at the time. He had mentioned to me, he's like, well, you, you got to do something crazy. You got to do something to get their attention to show that you're actually willing to, you know, be changed and go be a part of the program. And I called Sweens up and I said, I think I'm going to drive two days and I'm going to ask Stevie P for forgiveness. And you said, are you sure you don't want to call him first to make sure he's expecting you? I said, no, 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 I'm just going to show up. I'm going to show up. Impulsive is good in this case. And so what did I do? You showed up. You slept on my couch for the right. Uh, showed up, had a meeting, and uh, twenty minutes later was uh, not even, not even. I, I talked to Mike Sarant, the coach of the U of M Bison, who I believe is finally retired after thirty years. And I said, Mike, can you please give me, uh, you know, a note just stating that, you know what your experience with me was like. I can show that to Stevie P. But like, hey, like you're coaching the BCI. This guy's been a twenty five year coach in the U sport. I'm sure this has to mean something. So we got this whole nice uh, report from Mike Sarant. Great letter. And I drive the two days. I'm waiting outside after practice to, start to talk to Stevie P. I finally see him walk out. I said, hey, coach, you mind uh, you know, giving me a couple seconds of your time? I remember the, the first thing he said, he said, you better make this quick. You got 30 seconds. And I was like, well, here it goes. Here's my pitch. And I basically told him I wanted a second chance. And the second I started talking, I think he got the sense of what I was getting at. He started looking at his feet the whole time, never made eye contact with me again then. I gave him the letter, and he says, okay, thanks. Just put it in his pocket. I'm sure it went in the trash right after. And that was it. That was uh, the last time. And then I stayed on your couch the night before I headed back to uh, Winnipeg. And uh, yeah, that was the VAU Mariner Endeavor all together. That might be your craziest, one of the crazier vlogs, just because of how ridiculous it is. Just the impulsiveness behind that decision. I I was not thinking very stable at that point in time. I look back at it now and think, what the hell are you doing? You should have called me. Like, hey, I'm going to come talk to you. Yeah, maybe Sweeney's maybe Sweeney is right. Maybe he was on to something. But uh, yeah, tough times. And obviously fast forward now somewhat stuck in the fed xeno which is nice but uh, i know you mentioned before we started recording that stevie p may have uh, driven me into early hip surgery single-handedly i don't miss the warm-up drills at all tampa bay that. drill three on o's uh, colorado regroup T- tampa bay islanders oilers what every drill had an nhl team name um but i i personally love that warm-up drill because the forwards got to go on a three on o up the ice and you Have see their way with me. Trav just flopping around the ice, just and we're just like we're just slinging the biscuit around, like we we are tossing it, just bing 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 one timer in, like we're just. But this is also at like specifically for like second year because we our practices were at six in the morning, so six in the morning we were just tossing around, and like Huber and Clark are just like doing that that, that whole jingle. But uh, yeah, CVP responsible for hip surgery. I, I guarantee it. No stretch, no warmth. Let's just go right into a three on zero and let's see what uh, you got. Let's see some athleticism. Uh, how much time we got? That, that's it. We got a couple minutes left. We'll wrap okay. Up right well, now. I did want to bring up the U uh, Sports uh, semifinal. Yes. Um, which I don't know when this podcast is coming out, so this might be a little way later than uh, than the season. But uh, how about uh, you? You describe that video there. The just the goalie getting tossed. So U Sport Championship, UPEI. Semifinal, semifinal. U of A versus UPEI. Yep. University of Alberta playing University of PEI for the U Sport Semifinal Championship. The Golden Bears goaltender, Ethan Kruger, shout out the former Brandon Weeking, gets yossed. Absolutely yossed in this breakaway by the PEI guy. All hell breaks loose. Everybody grabs somebody. Yeah, full, get, full on breakaway. Full on breakaway. Yosses him. See you later. 
And then I guess, you know, the guys are dicing it up in the corner and one of the guys just sucker punches their goalie. Now, I got to say, although I am loyal to my Brandon Wheat Kings alumni and anybody who represents the amazing province of Manitoba, all six of us, but he sold that penalty probably harder than Mike Smith in the playoffs. That was a He flop. sold it better than when uh, the Canucks, the down goes Kane. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> and then the referee snows him in the face. <laughs> but what, what a... Uh... Well, what a vicious play. Oh, there you go. It's uh, pouring rain, outside. Rain Coover. I don't know if anybody can hear that, but um, yeah, what a what, what a play. What a uh, matchup. And yeah. yeah, that's all I got to say. So anyway, my friend, it's been a pleasure having you on the podcast. Good to see you again for the first time since episode three in person for the first time in two years as well. Uh, if you want to, you can check out Mr. Sweeney on uh, Instagram. I'll put some links in the uh, video description of the podcast. Uh, uh, if you want to check out the company I work a lot with, Send Season. Um, we throw events all over Canada. Um, so we're doing stuff in Victoria on April 6th, Calgary, April 28th. And then we also have to do stuff in Vancouver, Edmonton, Kelowna, uh, soon to be uh, London, Ontario, because we're going for that hockey influencer event that Trav did not get invited to, but somehow Brady Huber from Send Season gets invited to. So I'm going to explain that one. I'm a pigeon, but... Uh, if you are into the uh, party scene and a little bit of alcohol, you'll enjoy Mr. Sweeney's Sense Season Vlogs and their whole deal. But uh, for the time being, for the Sling the Biscuit podcast, we drop a new episode every Sunday at 11 in Eastern. That is 10 in Winnipeg, 9 in Calgary, 8 in the West Coast here in Vancouver. Shout out to Sheath, the amazing sponsor of the podcast. If you'd like to pick up some underwear, code BISCUIT69. We'll give you the best underwear the money can buy. And to Mr. Sweeney, thank you for joining the podcast. And I'm looking forward to the next time I get to do it with you, whether it's in person or not. Always a pleasure. <laughs>